Hollywood is back, baby, for series three. I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and with me as always is... The guy who, thankfully, has not been cancelled for that short film. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be uh, Andrew Roger Carson. That's me. And, my God, we're back for season three. The troublesome third series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although, speaking of that short, I think if uh, if they were going to cancel anyone, they'd probably get both of us with that one. No, no, no. Really? I, I hold my hands up for it. And to be honest, I, I like to think people have more of a sense of humour uh, nowadays. I know exactly the point where I was thinking, okay, this might be the one where people suddenly just trigger... Um, and it was it was a certain prop that was designed mm -hmm. <laughs> for it. And I remember as we were editing it, it was a case of, oh, my God, this should I include this? And I was like, no, you know, don't yeah. be a pussy. Just put it out there. Uh, at the end of the day, we always say this, and I believe we say this on our interview uh, at some point, um, getting offended is a choice, okay? No one purposely sets out to offend you. You decide to be offended over stuff. And if you did get offended over something that I put in our short little film, great. Thank you. You know, it proves that you watched it. Yes. <sighs> but in case you don't know what we're talking about, uh, it's a short that we, well, that Andy managed to get together, uh, which is a little promo for Series 3 and also featured some some choice clips, shall we say that were going to be in Rumble Rama originally, weren't they? Well, they still are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so basically, so... basically what it is, uh, Rumble Rama is, as some of you may know, a script that I wrote well, nearly 10 years ago. Nearly oh, yeah. 10 years ago. And it got optioned in Hollywood. I was going to go and direct it. It all turned into a bit of a cluster. And basically, uh, it didn't get end up getting made. I've been trying to get it made. And to be honest, uh, it came to a point where... I wanted to do something special for our season three launch, something a bit different. And I thought, I don't know, I'm just going to pull this scene from uh, my Rumble Rama script and we're just going to incorporate it into a short to promote Partywood. And we had a fantastic talent who showed up that day and none more special than uh, our people behind the cameras, which was Joanne Parker and Abby Kerwin of Blue Caribou Productions. They Hi, Blue are... Caribou Productions. Hello, Blue Caribou. You are my queens. The, the feedback has been really, really positive. I've got to admit, I've had plenty of messages come through of people who've watched it and absolutely loved it, people who want to be in the next one. Um, if we do a next one, <laughs> if well, we're it, around. <laughs> it depends, really. They probably took one look at me and just went, oh, my God, not only is Sasquatch real, but he usually eats at Burger King. My God. No, no. I think they were there saying, bloody hell. Nick Frost has let himself go. That's okay. We, we, we were both there. <laughs> we both had the uh, the winter weight on. That's all we can say. We yeah. shot this in December. Um, we obviously both spent the year not shedding the pounds. In fact, just piling them on. Yeah. And um, Something which I am trying to get myself uh, yes. back sorted now. Doing quite yes. well, actually. Yeah, yeah, we, we both have been um, separately, not together, because mm. that's just weird. And I'll tell you what, the one person that got the biggest reception online so far would be Stelius Katu. Yes. If you No, don't give the joke away. Don't give oh. the joke away. We want people to go onto our Facebook. We want people to go onto our YouTube, watch the video, and see if you can see Stelios and just the wood. It, oh, brilliant, brilliant side gag. Yeah, really he's is. got a future, that guy. I'm yes. telling you. He has a future in this business if he chases it. And he's, he's an architect by trade of Cheadle Architects. I will throw that out there. Now I've got to mention every other person who is in it and and what they do as a business in fact no no just just put it in the uh just put it in the comments yeah right <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't got all day but um and we haven't got all night either but speaking of nights let's talk about oh. batman gotham night well oh. done well done first first segue of the season and you nailed it i did i did i'm yeah. so proud of myself right uh yes yes batman uh arkham sorry 
I knew I was going to do that. Oh. Batman Gotham Knights. If you I accident, if I yeah, if I accidentally say Arkham Knight, it's because there is a game called Batman Arkham Knight. It's the last in the like the Arkham series. Um, but before we carry on and actually do the review, quick little confession. Um, Andy, you've not been too well recently. Um, you've had the no. corona. Um, I have. And when we recorded the, the final episode of the last series, I had the corona. And one of the, the side effects is it does kind of make your brain a little bit muddled. And when you pulled out Gotham Knight, I was there thinking, have I seen that? Haven't I seen it? It seems familiar. And we eventually said, no, just go away and watch it. Turns out, full disclosure, I have seen it. But I saw it like once way back in about 2009 when it first came out. Uh, actually, no, 2011. I remember that because it came included with the Arkham City video game. It was like a bonus that came in the collector's edition. So actually came out in 2008, but we'll, we'll let you off as soon as though your brain was obviously that frazzled. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting the release dates of the games mixed up with the release date of the film. Bad, bad Forget Steve. the games. I We're can't, talking also... about an animated movie here. Anyway, begin. Yes. Movie. So, the best way to think about Gotham Knight is it isn't a movie in the traditional sense. If you've seen, well, two things that spring to mind, but in particular, if you've seen the Animatrix, you'll know exactly what we're looking at here. There's a six... <laughs> individual anime episodes that are all batman based all by different directors with different uh different writers um and each different one... animation studios also yes different animation studios and each one has a thing which connects it to the next so it doesn't really have one full overarching story um, but there is a reference to one character which then feeds into another one and then there's a reference to an item like there's a gun which is dropped down a sewer and then in one of the later uh, shorts Batman finds the gun that's in the sewer and a load of other guns so there's little things which kind of link it together uh, in case you're wondering the other one we sprang to mind was Dante's Inferno which we Beautiful. both really really like oh, I love it uh, and I met the uh, the director of that Mike Deesa and I had to full-on praise Dante's Inferno it's so uh, good oh it's amazing so good um but yeah there's six the six different stories and are we it, going are, are we actually going to go through each individual one because no I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do like a brief cover so the, the six different stories is have I got a story for you crossfire field test in darkness dwells uh working through pain and dead shot yes um and they've all got their pluses and their minuses. Like, for example, the very first one, Have I Got a Story for You? Because um, it's four kids and they're all telling how they encounter Batman, each from a different perspective. As he's the changed. Russiaman effect, yes. as we call it. Yes, yes. Now, out of the loss of them, I think this is probably my least favourite because the animation style, I'm not a big fan of that animation style. <gasps> Really? I, I'm not. And to be honest, full disclosure, I'm also not a massive fan of anime overall. Um, you Freaking Charlotte. And I yeah, hey, you know, we like what we like. So the later <laughs> ones in particular, um I enjoyed I enjoyed more. I thought that uh working through pain was a nice little touch on where Bruce was getting his um his training from to become Batman because this was this was following on really from um Batman Begins and it had it felt like it had a lot more connective tissue to the Nolan verse than okay. anything else that was going on. Including the inclusion of uh, Lucius Fox, who up until Batman Begins had never really been used. Yeah, It's more of a minor character. Yeah. yeah, and now he's properly come to the front. Overall, it never really feels like it kind of pulls together. I mean, when you do watch something like The Animatrix, each of the the stories is entirely separate. And then when you watch something like Dante's Inferno, there is one solid narrative that follows it all the way through. It's just kind of broken up into different chapters. This, because it kind of hooks into the next, but it doesn't follow it through enough that it feels satisfying by the time that it gets to the end. It's like it's like you're watching an anthology as opposed to a single movie. So if you take it as six individual stories... I think you'd probably enjoy it more than if you were to see it as one great big piece, because as one great big piece, it feels a bit loose and and a bit rubbery. Whereas if you take it 
each story at a time, then you've got six very, very solid Batman stories. And a uh, big shout out has to go to uh, Kevin Conroy, who is my favorite Batman without question. And that includes everyone that's on screen. Uh, I remember watching the Batman animated series when I was a kid and you know, he then came back to voice Batman in the games, the Arkham games. Um, and there's there's one thing which always stuck in my head, going slightly off topic about Kevin Conroy, is he said that whenever he was doing the voice, he always considered the voice of Batman to be the character's true voice. And when he was doing the voice of Bruce Wayne, that was the fake one. Yes. So I always like that touch. So ever since I heard that, every time I see him do anything and he's doing the two characters... I always like to listen out for the difference. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of like my take on it all. Nice, okay. brief, to the point this time around. <laughs> yes. I'm going to disappoint you here because um, the first one, which is uh, Have I Got a Story for You, mm-hmm. I absolutely love um, the animation and the style. Uh, that one, as well as Walking Through Pain, mm-hmm. uh, were done by Studio 4C. Mm-hmm. Uh, which also have animated in the past. This is where my inner anime fan really comes out. Studio Four C. They had animated uh, fantastic movies like Spriggan, uh, Memories, uh, the absolutely phenomenal uh, Tekken King Creep. Uh, they're all in the box. You'll see them at some point. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have fun know. those nights. Nice to saying that I don't you like will. anime. Yeah. Yes, you had uh, Crossfire was done by Production IG, which was responsible for a lot of the Ghost in the Shell series, which mm-hmm. you can actually tell in the animation. Uh, you had Field Test, which was done by B-Train. Uh, they did a lot of anime like Noir and Madlax, to name a couple. And then, obviously, you have Madhouse. Now, Madhouse is, for me, it, it's the premier anime house. This was the house that did, they did... Uh, in Batman Gotham Knights, they were responsible for In Darkness Dwells and Deadshot. Mm. And, you know, this was the studio that did Ninja Scroll, uh, Wicked City, uh, Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust, three absolutely amazing animes. And they also do One Punch Man on Netflix as well, which is incredibly popular. I will say this, In Darkness Dwells, I think, was probably my favourite out of all of them. Yeah. The tone and the the uh, the atmosphere that was in that particular one. Oh, I think it's probably croc. the yeah. strongest it out of it. Amazing. And he's got a proper creepy horror vibe to it when he is oh, going yeah. down into the sewer and then Croc just comes out of nowhere because you've got all these floating corpses in the water. Yeah, it's it's why I love DC is because they can actually do what Marvel can't in these instances mm. and they can get really dark and violent and stuff like that. Um, I mean, for me, uh, and I watched it again just recently because it is on Now TV for people who do want to see it in the UK. Um I absolutely love the music in mm. in this movie. It is great. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean the animation is lush, especially the Madhouse ones. And uh, have I got a story for you? You know, it's all different, but it, the animation really is top notch. And it's directed by multiple Japanese animation directors as well. And uh, I thought it was really well edited together for an animated movie. And and yeah. I really enjoy it. I I really like it a lot. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I think just as six individual stories, it works brilliantly. But as a whole, as as one yeah. thing, I don't think it's as strong as its constituent parts. No, no that, that is fair enough. Yeah. Um, and that, that's the first of the uh, DC animated universe movies that we have covered on this mm-hmm. show. So I'm looking forward to the others. Although yes. we, we know not to pull out, um, what was it, Assault on Arkham, because I've seen that one. Yeah, directed by Jay Oliver. Yeah. Hi, Jay. Hello, Jay. Well, well, now we've got Batman Gotham Night out of the way. You can see it on Now TV uh, for you people looking to see it. And in the US, I guess you can watch it on HBO Max. Mm-hmm. I believe it is there. Uh, so go and check it out and see if you agree. And if you don't agree, let us know. If you do agree, let us know. That's what we want to hear. But for now, I guess it's time to rag on some anniversaries. <laughs> Watch them again all of the time Or we get them on Prime for free But we only know how old they are When we learn their anniversary The 
third series and we still haven't got a new jingle. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, the, the only problem is I was having this conversation with Neil the other day and he was like, you know why it doesn't work is because it's actually longer. Yeah. Um, so we agreed that we are going to do something new with anniversaries. We just haven't gotten around to it yet because we were trying to get that show out before the beginning of this series. Uh, we'll, we'll have something for series four. We will. We will. Yeah. Can you believe, Steve? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have three anniversaries this week. And the first one, 40 years ago this week, On Golden Pond was released. Uh, now, this is one of those movies that I've heard of, but I'll be damned if I know exactly what it is. I, I, Clint Eastwood, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you, you can tell by my scoffing that you are so wrong. <laughs> oh, is that like the Bridges of Madison County? I don't know. It was, it was something yes, featuring yes, old that... people filmed in sepia. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> no. Well, Bridges of Madison County is actually a really good film. Um, basically, On Golden Pond was, um, I guess you'd say, about a cantankerous retiree played by Henry Fonda, who's kind of uh, with his wife, played by Catherine Hepburn, in a kind of New England vacation home. And their daughter is played by Jane Fonda, who is Henry Fonda's real-life daughter. And it was a very big movie. And I remember the rights were chased forever. And I know that Jimmy Stewart originally wanted the rights for this movie. But I believe Jane Fonda... Uh, and we, we have... I know you're not doing your Jimmy Stewart impression, so forget about oh, it. Oh! No. You no. bastard. Save it for when Five All Goes West is doing an anniversary. <laughs> all right. But, we ever cover it but um yeah jane fonda this was around the time when she was um snap up some properties to produce obviously like uh one we mentioned the other week i've already forgotten what it was and the other being the china syndrome etc but um this was directed by a director by the name of mark rydell mm-hmm. who i guess kind of the older people will know he directed the steve mcqueen movie the reavers which is brilliant uh, the John Wayne movie, The Cowboys, which is infamous if you've ever seen the VHS version of Gremlins 2. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. yes, that was that was taken from The Cowboys. And uh, the Bette Midler movie, The Rose, which is um, it's kind of like A Star is Born, but in reverse. But yeah, this movie was like the, uh, the big Oscar winner uh, for that year. And amazingly, it, in their entire careers, it was the only time Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn had ever worked together, right. which is so strange when you see how long those like dominated Hollywood, and it was their among their last movies, and they they finally did this together, and it was originally kind of conceived as a project for all of the Fonders because Peter Fonda was supposed to be involved as well, but it turns out that they couldn't actually find a part for him in unless it was going to be incestuous with Jane Fonda because <laughs> they were going to be a married couple. I was like, yeah, that might be a bit too far oh Sorry, just stick him yeah. in drag yeah uh it, it has um some notable things that this is the first time a father and daughter were nominated for best actor and best supporting actress in the same year for the same film well that's, that's the only time that has ever happened. claimed to fame at least it is plus strangely enough between henry fonda and jane fonda this was the only film they have ever done together okay uh Ooh. also has a record here for Henry Fonda, the longest gap between two Oscar wins. He had 41 years between when he won the Oscar for Grapes of Wrath and this was his final movie that he won an Oscar for as well. And he still holds the record as the oldest actor to have ever won an Oscar. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this. There was a lot, yeah. Uh, other, uh, it was also Catherine Hepburn won an Oscar for this as well and it was her fourth and final Oscar. So she'd won four Oscars in her career, and this was the fourth and final one. Right. And an interesting bit of trivia for you here, Steve. This was the second highest grossing film of the year behind Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ah, that that does actually surprise me, you know. Yeah. Touching melodrama or Indiana Jones punching Nazis. Yeah. No, it's just one of those quiet melodrama movies, really. But it's really good. 
I mean, I really do enjoy this movie. I mean, Catherine Hepburn is the standout out of all the actors. Of course, Henry Fonda and Jane Fonda are brilliant in it as well. And it's a beautifully written film. And it is one that's going to be in the box at some point. So you will get to see it for yourself unless you get a bit uh, curious and decide to pull it out yourself. What about the film? <laughs> there were. Mm. But yes, uh, I actually, uh, when I saw Jane Fonda when I was at Paramount Pictures, uh, when they were doing... Um, Grace and Frankie for Netflix because I was there to meet Mike Sheen and I, I saw Jane Fonda there and it was like, oh, if I could talk to her about any film, it'd probably be Clute, but this would be the other film that I would love to just like pick her brain on. Maybe next time, Jane. Maybe but yes, uh, On Golden Pond is 40 years old this week. Okay, wonderful. All right, what have we got next? Well, can you believe, Steve? I mean, this is the interesting thing, because I know you'll have seen none of these three, but I can guarantee you all three of them are in the box. Can okay. you believe, Steve? 35 years ago this week, Platoon was released. Oh, no, I haven't. Yeah, this is surprises me that you have not seen this film, because it's... I've seen the poster. No. That was about it. <laughs> Everyone's seen the poster. Come on. I, I'll hands down say Platoon goes... If I had a list of the top 50 greatest films ever made, I would put Platoon in there. Directed by everyone's favourite crazy director, Oliver Stone. Uh, <laughs> conspiracy theorist galore. Uh, who you may know of such films as um, JFK. I've seen that one. Uh, Natural Born, yeah, Natural Born Killers. One. Born on the 4th of July. Not seen that one. Well, you two out of three ain't bad. Rest in peace, meat love. Yeah. Um, this is probably one of the best movies about Vietnam other than um, Apocalypse Now, I would say. And it holds the distinction of being the first ever time that a Vietnam veteran has actually directed a movie on the Vietnam War, because Oliver Stone was a Vietnam veteran. Oh, ah, I did not know that. No, no, it's very true. And yeah. a lot of the experiences of the Sheen's character, shout out to Charlie, are based on uh, Oliver Stone's own experiences. So it is very autobiographical. And if you hear the director's commentary, like I listened to again this week, and I watched uh, a documentary on it as well, um, it, it is very kind of haunting. These these stories are incredibly true, of what happened to this platoon. The things that I love about it is you've got Tom Berenger, who was known for playing the heroic character in movies up until that point. You know, he was always the hero of the movie. And this time he's playing like uh, the real asshole. He, he's he's the bad guy. Okay, he's the bad Sergeant Barnes. And then you've got Willem Dafoe, currently going through a career resurgence right now, uh, and is on a on Saturday Night Live last night. Nice. But um, Willem Dafoe had played the bad guy in movies like To Live and Die in L.A. and all stuff like that up to that point. And in this, he plays uh, the main good guy. Have you ever uh, seen How I Met Your Mother? Uh, no, I've never no. watched it. No, there was a joke in that by uh, Jason Siegel comes out with a joke saying that uh, Willem Dafoe sounds like a conversation between a bullfrog and an owl. Willem. <laughs> Dafoe! Willem. Dafoe! All oh, right, okay. Yeah. That's American humour for you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is, but I guarantee it, next time you see him, you'll be thinking the exact same thing. Yes. So some notable things about Platoon that I have found out from uh, various bits of research mm -hmm. over this last week, because I do research. Originally, the, the Charlie Sheen role uh, in the 1970s when um, Oliver Stone was trying to get it made, because it took well over 10 years, well over 15 years to get this movie made, when Oliver Stone returned from Vietnam and, and wrote the script for it. Uh, originally, he had contacted... Jim Morrison to play that role. As in the musician? Yes, as in lead singer of The Doors. And what is incredibly haunting about it is when Jim Morrison was found dead in his Paris apartment, uh, he had the script for Platoon on him when he was found. Ooh. Yes, interesting bit of trivia there. Yeah. Uh, also, there is a scene in the movie, and it's probably the most haunting scene that people do remember from Platoon, when uh, Charlie Sheen and Kevin Dillon find this kind of... Uh, one-legged youth uh, in the Vietnamese village who's hiding under a bed, and Kevin Dillon like viciously pistol whips him to death, 
and it's it's one of those scenes that it really is harrowing to watch but in true charlie sheen and i guess kevin dylan style uh the young child who was playing it actually had cataracts and they were from like a poor village you know they, they'd found all of these like extras and all that to play them in uh, i want to say it was thailand i don't think it was thailand charlie sheen and kevin dylan actually pulled all the money for him to have this operation that uh, cured him of cataracts oh wow big up to him big up to him then yes a lot of people will say all the negative stuff about charlie sheen but trust me there are a lot of good stories about charlie sheen as well that never get the coverage uh other interesting fact on this oliver stone actually did have a heart attack on set whilst directing this movie didn't uh go um i know you're gonna go the martin sheen sequence do martin sheen had a heart attack on apocalypse now which is eerily prophetic really two vietnam movies starring two sheens and two heart attacks i loved you in wall street (laughs) <laughs> but I can imagine it for Oliver Stone. I mean, he's reliving one of the most traumatic things in his life, mm. which was, you know, the time in Vietnam War. It's obviously going to be very stressful. And I don't think he was liked by the cast and crew because he rigorously put them through boot camp, <laughs> which uh, if you see the documentary, John C. McGinley talking about what they had to go through, <laughs> I can guarantee you every single member of that cast probably hated his guts. Yeah, well, that just means that Got- you're doing a good job, though. Oh yeah, yeah, and it works. You you watch this movie, you can see that these aren't Hollywood stars, you know, just transported onto a movie set. These guys look like they were really going through hell. And you've got people in there like um, obviously John C. McGinley, who just mentioned uh, Johnny Depp, uh, Forrest Whitaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had like the the who's who of you know up and coming acting talent in this movie. And then of course you've got the obligatory Dale Die appearance. <laughs> Wait, who's Dale who's in Dye? Every, Dale Dye is the guy who's in every single war movie or military movie or anything. Wait, yes, from Casualties I, of War. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I know and, you mean that. Uh, you know, he has a role in this, and the the funniest things about it, which I'm I'm dying to one day come across Dale Dye and ask him why, is apparently there's a scene right at the beginning of Platoon where all of these body bags are being taken. And, and being loaded onto a plane. And apparently Dale Dye was one of the bodies in the body bag. <laughs> what, was he just um, bored? Uh, I think he must have been bored that day. He's like, oh, we haven't got anyone to play a body. Dale Dye's like, well, I'll get in. And there's a scene towards the end where they're obviously throwing all of these um, dead Vietnamese people into a pit, like they used to do in the Vietnam War. And apparently this woman who gets thrown into a pit was Dale Dye's wife. Oh, lovely. <laughs> who was Vietnamese. Um, so it's like... This is the most bizarre story I think I'm ever going to take away (laughs) from this. Um, The fact about it is Platoon, you know, it was a major Oscar winner, won four Academy Awards. It was the third highest grossing film of the year behind, (laughs) oh dear, behind Crocodile Dundee and Top Gun. Uh, Well, I've seen one of them. You've not seen Top Gun? I've not seen Top Gun. Oh, all right, okay. Yeah, that was a good guess. Everyone's yeah. seen Crocodile and Day. Yeah, because usually it's on BBC One at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they butcher it to try and make it family-friendly. Hey, still to this day, Crocodile Dundee is the highest-watched movie on BBC One in history mm. for its premiere on Christmas Day. Yeah. Uh, Stand up to the film, it's, it's amazingly directed. Uh, it's amazingly edited. The sound is incredible. The casting is like a, a veritable who's who. And, you know, these are... Like I said before, these are grizzled actors really going for it. Cinematography is great. Stand-up performances, Tom Berenger and Willem Dafoe. You know, face off each other throughout the entire movie. It is in the box. You're going to see it. It's going to be one of the best films you're going to watch. Okay, brilliant. I guess we've got one more. Yes, so that's two, and I've not seen it. Let's see if you can go for the trifecta. What is the third one? Uh, this is it's kind of a random one, really. But 25 years ago this week, a movie called Fly Away Home was released. Is that the one with the geese? Yes. The Canada geese. Yes. And it's, oh. The Canada geese. I can't remember what the, what the kid was. Was he Was he the same kid that was in Free Willy? No. No. Yeah, no, It's it's it wasn't male at all. Uh, the kid was uh, Anna Paquin, who went on to become Rogue in yes. X-Men. And uh, from... Is it True Blood or Vampire Diaries? I think she was a True Blood. Of... True Blood, yeah. Uh, but this was uh, directed by Carol Bollard, who did a lot of stuff with animals, 
in the realm of movies, I will add, <laughs> such, such as uh, Duma, The Black Stallion. But, uh, oh, a bit of something interesting for you, um, Carol Ballard, was a second unit photographer on Star Wars A New Hope, by the way. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. there you go. Star, Star Wars reference. Yes, nice. it is the story of a father and daughter who lead a flock of orphaned Canadian geese south by air. Is, is it Bill Paxton, Bill Pullman? Won the <laughs> Jeff bills? Daniels. Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was someone yeah. with floppy hair, I knew. Yes, yes, Jeff Daniels, uh, fresh from uh, Dumb and Dumber. I mean, the movie is really well shot as well, uh, as Carol Ballard's movies always are. But um, the thing that I, the reason why I wanted to raise this today, because when I watched Fly Away Home, and not too long ago, I'd watched a movie called The Squid and the Whale, okay, which is a drama movie. You'll, you'll get to see it at some point. Now, in Fly Away Home, Jeff Daniels is the father to Anna Paquin in the movie. In Squid and the Whale, they have a sex scene together. <laughs> oh! And I've got to think, how weird must that have been <laughs> oh because that's creepy as yeah because obviously he's, he's playing like an older i think i can't remember he's an older guy and he's got a younger lover who's played by anna paquin but i'm thinking that must have been the most horrifying thing knowing that literally <laughs> what 10 15 years yeah. earlier you were playing a dad to this little girl Bill, can you imagine reading the script and going, all oh, right, okay, yeah, this is a really good film. Oh, I've got a love scene. All right. Can't wait to see who I'm pired up against. And then you yeah. go down to set and it's just like, oh, my God. Yeah. I'm a monster. <laughs> I can only imagine the talk these two must have had before. And if, um, more pleasure to Jeff Daniels. What a pro. He must have just, gone, <laughs> you know, he's obviously gone with it. But I can imagine that he's probably had to talk to his shrink about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, as John Ashton uh, said about Charles Grodin, oh, you're one of those who obviously doesn't feel they need a shrink or whatever it was. But um, yeah, I thought that was too good to kind of pass up as a point <laughs> for the anniversaries. And I was struggling for Fly Away Home because it is a great movie. <laughs> The thing is, after dropping that bombshell, there is nothing else that you could possibly say about Fly Away Home. They, they, could, they could have won or equaled or <laughs> had as many Oscar wins to beat Return of the King and Titanic. Yeah. No, the fact of the matter is 15 years later, those two had a sex scene. Oh, dear. Uh, That's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> There's some psychiatry bills. I'm not sure if it's going to be Anna Parkwins or Jeff Daniels is going to be more costly. Welcome to Series uh, 3, I'm saying, everyone. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Series 3. Uh, we open with probably one of the most disturbing things we've ever had to flag about a children's movie. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. I, f I feel dirty even coming out with that now. I know. Oh. Anyway, that, that's the anniversaries for this week, and I'm sure it's an anniversary two actors will never want to hear ever no. again. Uh, the see, thing is now, wait till you see Squid and the Whale. That's going to completely have that image in your head now and the squid and the whale is a beautiful movie it's a brilliant movie but it's um it, it's just added a new layer of disturbance <laughs> um i have absolutely nothing that i can bring to that i'm i'm, I'm kind of floored by it. i'm just trying to it's just the logistics of it all and just trying to get your head around that you you wait for the day we get either Anna Paquin or Jeff Daniels on the show, and we've got to mention these two movies. Of oh, course, and we'll be like, ah, uh, yeah. So, um, so Jeff, yeah, you know, you did Speed, which was a big hit, and you know, then you did Dumb and Dumber, that was a big hit, and then you did Fly Away Home. <laughs> um... <Yes>. So, <laughs> so yes, after after that disturbing bit of news, uh, that's the anniversaries for this week. We'd yeah. better bring the guest in, haven't we? Oh, God, if he wants to now. <laughs> Let's break him in. Well, today we have a celebrated American screenwriter, director, producer, painter, musician. They're five separate impressive careers, unless you go into a Job Seekers Allowance interview. Known as an expert of the odd couple buddy-buddy formula, especially with work on such films as Wise Guys, 
Midnight Run, popular classic on our show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the original Bad Boys, Double Take, and so many others. He is a winner of the coveted Arts for the Parks Award. He has held three, as it stands, one-man exhibitions in New York City. He's an accomplished saxophone player. He is a well-respected creative in the worlds of film, music, and art. And the man behind the legend is a fascinating individual. So naturally, we wanted to bring him along for some talk on how all these various art forms play into the career of George Gallo. So joining us from, I guess, Lost Variants, it's called nowadays, the amount of COVID that's going around. Good morning, George. How are you? Good morning. How are you? <laughs> We're great. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, no, you got it. That's very funny. Well, it's very, it's, that's, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, you know, I've been uh, pretty much uh, uh, behind uh, locked doors anyway. You know, I, I'm, I'm a half-ass recluse. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Grey Gardens, but that's, that's what yeah. a lot of our friends <laughs> call Julie and I, you know. <laughs> Funnily enough, I actually saw a movie version they did of Grey Gardens that Drew Barrymore was in. And it was yes. Like, it, was, it was a really bizarre casting choice, but it worked so well. Yeah, she did a phenomenal job because I'm familiar with Grey Gardens, you know, the Maisel's brothers, you know. So I was familiar with the movie. And then when I – yeah, she did great. I thought it was a, I thought it was terrific. Well, George, to really get an understanding of where you came from, that being New York originally – I guess mm-hmm. you can kind of tell by the accent you've not really crossed over to the Los Angeles accent yet. But uh, no, no, dude, down... no, dude, no, <laughs> no, no, man, no, man. Yes. Whoa, but, I mean, <laughs> that was great, man. So starting out, I mean, were you a geek for film? I mean, what movies spoke to you at a young age growing up in New York? You know, I, I grew up uh, north of the city in Port Chester, which is about 40, 45 minutes, uh, you know, uh, anything uh, 10 minutes north of Manhattan, they call it upstate, you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up certainly in the shadow of, of New York City. I, I, you know, I had a curiosity about anything with the arts. It, it didn't start out necessarily with just movies, uh, you know. Uh, so when I was in the fourth grade, I started, uh, I had took an interest in the saxophone I was, I'd already been painting and drawing a lot as a, as a kid. And, you know, movies sort of seemed like a natural extension from that, you know, in that it was visuals and it was sounds and music. And I love stories. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I loved science fiction movies. So, like, I loved War of the Worlds, you know, the, 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 yeah. the uh, mm-hmm. from 1953. I watched it so many times. I, you know, I started to memorize it, you know, toward the end of the 20th century. No one would believe that human affairs are being watched cleanly and closely by intelligence vastly greater than our own. Yet across the Gulf of space on the planet Mars, intellects vast and cool regarded our Earth with unsympathetic eyes, slowly but surely drawing their plans <laughs> against us. The chances of anything coming from Mars. Are yeah, yeah, to... yeah, right. So I watched it so much. So I fell in love with movies and, and my dad, I begged my father, there was no you know, obviously, this is the late 1960s, let's say, I was a, when I was a kid, you know, mid, mid to late 60s. I, I'm like a teenager. I, I begged my dad to get a tape recorder because there was no VHS yet. You know, you mm. couldn't record movies off of TV. So I just recorded the sounds, you know, with a tape recorder. And I, would, I had yeah. all these movies on file. And I would sit and listen to them with my headphones on, trying to, you know, visualize them. And so that stimulated the whole visual thing, and I would start drawing little storyboards. And so, yeah, I was kind of a, I guess, geeky movie kid, which I, I think, you know, I, you know, my parents, God bless them, thought that there was obviously something wrong with me, you know, because I, I would draw little pictures of Martians and listen to movies with headphones on. You know, I I hold my dad as much as I think it left him scratching his head and thinking, what is this child going to grow up to be, you know, other than some lunatic. Uh, I hold him also <laughs> responsible because my father loved movies. And, you know, he loved The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And mm, he loved classic. all those Bogart movies. Yeah, I know you. You're the man in the hole who wouldn't give us the rifle. You know, it's I mean, he... And then he would get the giggles watching these movies, and I, he kind of drew me into it because he, he was such a fan 
of stories and of odd characters and and it it stimulated an interest in me and these in sort of bizarre quirky people so all of that played into it you know it was like that was like the the soup i guess you would call it of of the of the beginnings of my interest in all of this stuff and then i started writing little short stories and little scripts and you know i won a couple of awards for in my local school for writing short stories stories about these make believe people so i mean that's kind of where it all started fun i find that so amazing you are the first person that i've ever come across who did the whole recording the sound of the movie thing because i used to do that myself i used up two 90 minutes tapes i did as well on uh, on doing judgment at nuremberg and i used to listen to judgment at nuremberg all of the time that 12 angry men and um the naked city oh, used to God. always be black and white movies that i would listen to because it had such a different sound well that's you know it's amazing yeah you know you uh you went for more highbrow material than i did you know i mean i i <laughs> i was recording uh, war of the worlds was probably the best but i was recording things like earth versus the flying saucers <laughs> and in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is a terrific movie. Mm. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I watched it recently with my wife. I was just, holy cow, that movie was great. The original yeah. uh, uh, 1956, Kevin McCarthy, uh, Dana Winter. Uh, but then, uh, but I uh, like Gorgo, uh, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, The Giant Behemoth. I mean, those are the movies awesome. that I was, yeah, which I love, The Giant Behemoth, which is like the giant big thing. You know, the English title, the British title was uh, Behemoth the Sea Monster. But leave it to the Americans to come up with the giant big thing. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, that's how, that, but I just had this sort of fascination with it. And uh, it's funny. Then I ended up getting into comedy, you know, um, not monsters and, and, and things from outer space, which I still would like to do with something like that. Uh, my real dream, if I have a dream, before I shed this mortal coil, I want to do the Day of the Triffids, which I read the oh, John Wyndham oh, novel. God, yeah. I, I read that when I was like twelve, and I think I've read it thirty times since. And I just love that effing book. I want to do that as a nine-part miniseries. More than uh, I just want desperately to do it. I don't even need to reference the book. I just give me a pen and a pad. I can write all nine episodes. I'd love to direct it. I just love that novel and they've done many versions of it but they never caught the essence of the book the last version i saw of it i think the bbc here in the uk did a version yeah. of it with eddie izzard in it um yeah i saw was... that it wasn't bad you know it caught mom but the book had a kind of there's a kind of melancholy when i when i go out in nature and i i see trees and grass and clouds and all of those things and i start trying to paint it you know i I become aware of my mortality very quickly because like, you know, the tree is two, 300 years old, you know, and I'm 65 and I'm going to be gone at some point. That tree is still going to be here. And I realized that it's all just fleeting. Everything is fleeting in life. And, you know, and, and even the moment that you're trying to capture, it's already gone. The second you put the brush to canvas, it's, it's a memory. So there's something, there was something in Wyndham's book that I loved that it was about there was a kind of melancholy and uh, of things lost that can't be gotten back the way he describes society falling apart little by little by little that you, you know you don't know how good you've got it till it's gone and there was a lot of that in the book you know everyone was left to their own devices and then started to getting into survival mode but it was a very emotional and intellectual look at loss which is what I thought really the book was about ultimately. Yeah, it's yeah. about man-eating plants and all of that stuff, you know, all of that cool stuff that would be so fun to, to do visually. But it was really about something far deeper. Uh, anyway, I, I just love that book. I would love to make that. If anyone's listening that wants to finance it, I'm in 100%. You don't have to call my agent. Call me personally and uh, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Following on from the the depth of that, recently during the pandemic, which 
in which society pretty much fell apart. Uh, from yes. 2020 until today, we've seen two movies released with yourself in the writer, producer and director chair. With The Comeback Trail, starring Robert De Niro, Morgan Freeman and Tommy Lee Jones. And Vanquish, which also starred Morgan Freeman and Ruby Rose. So how was releasing these two high profile movies during this infamous time frame when the industry was ground to a halt? Well, Comeback Trail still has to come out in the States. They're talking about March or April, you know. Um, it hasn't been released here yet. Oh. We, we, we shot we've it. it on Now TV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, you guys have got it. I know that, which is great. I'm glad that people are seeing it. It, it, uh, it kept getting delayed because of COVID. You know, first it was supposed to come out uh, like, like November of, of 2020, and then, uh, then spring of 2021, and then fall of 2021, and then... Then that gets jettisoned, and now now they're talking about this year. So it's it's sort of like uh, I can't wait for it to come out. I mean, it won four or five film festivals. I mean, people loved it. There was a test preview in Toronto, and it scored uh, it scored a ninety seven. So mm. I was like, wow, that's. I mean, I, have you guys seen it? Yes, I watched it uh, last night. Funnily enough. And, oh, you uh, watched it last night? Yes, uh, on Now TV. Thank you, Sky. And uh, I, I've got to admit, I've really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I haven't got round to watching it because I don't seem to have much time these days. But no, I, the trailer looked fantastic. It looked the, really the, funny. It's a it's a really funny movie. It's you know it's it's funny because that script had been around for quite a while. Uh, I wrote it with Josh Posner, and we gave it to a few people, and and uh, the, the, it had sort of the check the boxes as to why not to make it which was, it was a period piece that takes place in the 70s. It was a, a movie about making a movie. It's a dark comedy. So like it's got, and it, of all things, they're trying to make a Western. So I knew it had a couple of things, let's say, going against it in terms of what studios are always looking for. But studios are always looking for what worked yesterday. You know, and if this movie comes out and does well, then suddenly everybody will make a movie like this, you know. But the reason this movie got made was largely because of my relationship with Robert De Niro, who I gave the script to personally, who read it and said, this script is hysterical. And I said, thanks. And he goes, I'll do this with you. So then suddenly, oh, oh, we love Comeback Trail. you know. But Comeback Trail is, I mean, the reason Bob got such a kick out of it, you know, Bob De Niro, uh, was because the 70s was, you know, his heyday. Mm. It was my certainly my beginnings, because I'm, I'm like 10, 11 years younger than, than he is. But he knew, personally, a lot of the guys that that movie was sort of uh, referencing. Because he plays a bottom-feeding, complete loser movie producer, making the worst movies on earth. And he knew some of those guys in New York. And I knew them, too. So the second he read the script, he called me. And I don't want to mention names, but he would say... Is that so and so? And I went, yeah, of course it's so and so, you know. <laughs> and and he just busted a gut laughing because he also knew these characters, and he he definitely got the joke. So so comeback trail uh, was shot just pre COVID, so we beat that. Uh, Vanquish, Vanquish uh, was shot during COVID, mm-hmm. which was an interesting <laughs> exercise in filmmaking because because of covid there were a lot of things we couldn't do so we decided well let's screw it let's make the movie anyway because morgan wanted to do it and ruby wanted to do it it was largely self-contained in that it was the house and then her in the street and it always kind of had a walter hill vibe to me anyway because if you notice yeah. movies like the warriors mm-hmm. you know there were never any extras in the street you know, like if you look at the movie the warriors which i love the warriors but it literally makes no sense that six guys have to run all the way from the Bronx down to Coney Island. I mean, what, there's no cabs, you know? I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> there's no buses. You're in New York City, like 20 million people live there. But there's not an extra in the street. There's not a cab anywhere. So it's this sort of Wild West, slightly alternate universe. So we were going to kind of make the movie that way anyway. And then we said, well, you know what, with COVID... You know, let, let's j- jettison this idea of extras and let's just make them the only people populating this universe. You know, it has been done successfully before in the past. So let's examine that. But while we were shooting, 
uh, and everybody was, you know, being tested for COVID every three minutes. Uh, we had a false positive. We had to shut down. Uh, and then after that, we had a hurricane come. So we were really up against it, you know, making that film. And a 25-day schedule went down to 15 days. And that entire movie was shot basically in, I think, 15, to, uh, 15 days with two or three wow. days of, of second unit. And uh, I was sort of amazed it even made sense at the end, you know, because mm -hmm. we were... Uh, you know, we were trying to, you know, we were trying to make a movie under very extreme circumstances. I mean, look, ultimately, and I haven't seen it in a while. Ultimately, I remember liking it and feeling good about it. But, um, you know, COVID is not conducive to making movies because with a movie crew, everyone's on top of everybody else. And, uh, you know, everyone's in everybody's face. You know, that's generally how movies are made. Everyone's shouting over everybody else, you know, because it's sort of organized chaos. You know, this is it odd. You know, this is sort of goes against how movies are made in that everyone has to be isolated. Everyone has, you know, uh, there's a part of me that likes it because not every person on earth is running up to me asking me questions which I always find to be highly distracting. I'm trying to think about a million different things. And then someone comes up to me and says, makeup wants to talk to you about so-and-so's earring. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Just, you know, just <laughs> leave me alone, you know. And, and you're never going to see it. It's an extra 300 feet in the background, you know. But anyway, so, <laughs> but I understand that everybody has to run up to the director and ask him questions. That part of it I didn't miss. But COVID's a very difficult way to uh, make a movie. Mm -hmm. And... I've done a movie since then, since Vanquish, that I that I finished that I, I, I like very much called Muti. But we shot that under COVID restrictions, which was again an interesting experience. But we didn't have any any issues, thank God. Nobody tested positive when we were working and it went very, very smoothly. And that was a more complicated movie to make because we were shooting some of it in Europe and some of it in, in Mississippi in the States. But that movie is I've seen it all finished, cut. Uh, the composer's writing the music now, Aldo Schlock, who is doing an amazing job. And he, it, uh, if I if I could talk about that for for thirty seconds, is it, uh, what's interesting about making a this is a sort of an old school white knuckle thriller. What's interesting about making a movie like that was I, I've always wanted to make a Billy Friedkin type of movie. Mm. Well, Billy oh, Friedkin, yeah. I know. I know Billy very well, you know, and I talked to him a couple times before I started shooting it. You know, I, I read his book. I don't know. Did you read his book, uh, The Friedkin Connection? I have read that book. I love uh, William Friedkin. Sorcerer is one of my favorite movies. Sorcerer is a freaking masterpiece. Okay? Yes. And it is all just images and ideas. And uh, like uh, 45 minutes goes by and not a lot really happens other than you see four guys do some pretty dastardly things. Then they all end up in this this terrible place, and it's just images and, you know, those crabs on the ground and that poor kid walking around naked and, you know, and it just, just this place. And, you, it, and it takes its sweet time. And at the same time, you're always on edge watching it, which is, is interesting. Yeah. So I... I love that kind of movie making, but I never had the opportunity to do something like that because I'm not known for it. So when this script came my way and I read it, I thought to myself, well, this is at first I didn't know how to do it. I'm, I'm not going to do this, you know, but then I started thinking about it. Well, if I can start to really play around with the storytelling of it, I'd love to do a movie where it's not traditional in that, well, this happens, and then this happens, and then this leads to this, and then, and then, and then, I didn't want to do it that way. Because they become plotty, and they become, like, just full of shit, if I could say that. And and uh, and it's like, oh, I haven't seen this before. You know, and, and it is a genre movie in that it is a person killing children, and uh, these these two men who get drawn into this case... Uh, so it, it is a genre movie, but I didn't want to handle it in the typical genre way. So like I watched cruising, which is a tough movie to watch. I watched cruising. Oh, yeah. 
I must have watched Cruising 15, 20 times. Uh, and I kept watching it and watching it and watching it. And I'm like, you know, there's not a lot going on in, 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 in the traditional sense that here's a clue and then here's another clue and then here's another clue. And, oh, there's another clue. And, you know, it, it's just sort of, it's like a window into a world, into a place. And it's very uncomfortable to watch because there's a sense of dread going on and a, mm. a sense of hopelessness and a kind of a nihilistic view of the world, which is the exact opposite of what I normally do because, you know, there's always seems to be a, for lack of a better explanation in a lot of the stories I've told, there always seems to be like God is all, always somewhere in the room. You know, there's always some sense of, let's say, a moral compass. This movie doesn't have, a lot of his movies don't have that to me. And this movie certainly doesn't have it. So I had to rely on images and music and sounds to tell the stories and hope that that would keep you riveted. Now, when I first saw the movie all put together, I knew instinctively that two thirds of the movie is missing. So if you looked at it raw, you'd go, what is this about? But now that the music is coming into play and the sound design is coming into play, which is just the last week that I've been watching it all come together, I am so jacked up about it again because I am so happy that I had the guts to not rely on conventions to tell this story. And I think I've put together something very interesting and that I didn't like again I'm not to be redundant but I it's it really is a story that's taking its time but you, you it's very compelling you know it's about a guy who's got some real this cop in Mississippi who's got some real problems you're not exactly sure what it's Cole Hauser by the way mm. who's terrific he doesn't say very much he doesn't interact very much with people you, you know that he's haunted by something and it's this slow boil uh, that I'm now that I see again the the composer and I had long talks about just sound design and music is sound design little things that are setting them off and without that element it's just you know what I mean it's like when you put down the color blue or you put down the color purple in a painting. You don't realize how good that purple is until you put orange next to it, orangey yellow, because those two colors are opposites on the color scale. And you go, wow, that's a pretty purple. And you go, yeah, well, it wasn't that great by itself. It's very much like in painting. It only works because of what's lying next to it. And, you know, green sure. only looks great because of red. Um, so it's the same thing with this movie. Uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm happy that I had the guts to stick my neck out to do it this way. Like, look, it's not going to be for everybody. You know, some people might look at it and go, I don't get it, man. And it's not, you know, there's not a body crashing through a window every two seconds. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm glad you guys are laughing. I mean, you know, th there's always, it's very interesting. There's always the comfort level. Well, if I do this, that, and this, that, and other thing, you know, it, it, it should work because it worked in all these other movies. And what you don't realize you're digging the ultimate hole is, yeah, it's just like everything else. And that's why it sucks. You know, it's mm. like you've already seen it <laughs> a thousand times. It's like, you know, you might have some comfort level in that it's like everything else. But in the end, well, now what? It's like everything else. What's so great about that? You know, I think this is far more compelling I, I'm very happy with the way this movie's turning out. To be honest, I mean, it, it's the kind of movie that would interest me because, I mean, I think we're all so desensitized with the what we call the kind of the Fast and the Furious generation of movies now. Yeah. I mean, like myself, I, I'm guessing that your world would kind of been rocked by stuff like uh, Scorsese's Mean Streets. Yeah, Mean Streets is one of the reasons I, I, I suddenly became interested in filmmaking. I... I, I... I remember it was around nine. I mean, well, I would already had an interest in filmmaking because of everything that we talked about. But I think it was seventy three or seventy. I think it was like an eleventh grade. Somebody invited me to some film festival. I'd never heard of it, and I saw Mean Streets at some film festival. And I think it was like an Italian American thing. I can't really remember. 
but it was it, it, the movie hadn't come out yet or it was about to come out and I saw it and the second I saw Robert De Niro in slow motion walking through the bar to Jumping Jack Flash oh, I was like yeah. holy <laughs> shit we have arrived. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's like I gotta make movies, like dan 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 dan, dan, dan. and then he's moving in slow motion, and that dolly shot into Harvey Keitel, and then you know De Niro moving in slow motion. It's really funny, like that I would see that movie as a young man, and then that guy that's moving in slow motion would become <laughs> a friend of mine, and we would end up making yeah. movies together. You know, I mean, when I start to connect the dots of my life. It, 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 I'm pretty charmed, but but the guy that saw that movie, that kid. I mean, I was as far away from Hollywood. I mean, I might as well have been on on Venus. You know, I mean, I had no idea that I was going to get to Hollywood and make movies. I I wanted to, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. Yeah, I've I've always kind of picked on this um, sensitivity of yours that this, the 70s was really this influential thing, and it was the same for me. I mean, I grew up with uh, like Walter Hill's The Driver, which I love. Uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, which I think is amazing. Yeah, the driver is fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle. Um, oh, dude, 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 yeah, dude. The Friends of Eddie Coyle. I can't believe you brought that up. Is one it's of amazing. my ten favorite movies of all time. I, I know Steve has not seen it. <laughs> I haven't. No, because I'm a. Philistine. It is so unfull of shit and so raw and so uh, Peter Yates, man. It's so brilliant in that you don't feel the fingerprints of the director. Or like, like today, yes. I've said this before, every freaking director wants you to know that they were there, that they did this, and aren't I smart, and aren't I fancy, and did you see what I just did? I'm waiting for them to jump out in front of the camera and go, hold up, hold up, hold up. Did you see what I just did? I was like... Dude, if you're doing your job, I don't want to know that. I, I don't want to know that it was there. I don't need to know that you're a genius. You know, it's like it, the the story and the acting and the filmmaking all have to be one cohesive idea. Now, that's my personal opinion. That's why I love those movies. But it's funny. Sometimes I read reviews of my movies, and they say that like they feel like I'm not present. And that I'm uh, like asleep behind the camera and I don't have necessarily, uh, let's say, a visual style. And I'm like, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to do, you dummy. You know, I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to let it all unfold. I was trying to I have to fight every instinct to jump in and say, hey, let's try this. This will be I, I will really fool them with this one. I have to fight those instincts. I mean, I don't. Because it's it's not about me. It's about it. It's about the story. It's not about yeah. Whatever. I get so frustrated. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but yes, yes, yes. The friends of Eddie Coyle. Like the stick. Of, the way that movie starts. It starts so dry. You know, with oh, that yeah. guy walking out to his car. You know. Anyway, I'm so glad I'm talking to people who know something about movies. Well, so <laughs> well, well, anyway, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh... You know, I mean, Why, I, Steve I born... Hester doesn't know shit? <laughs> I don't actually know. That, that's a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm just here for the sex appeal. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I was born at the, the, the arse end of the 70s, but I grew up watching all of the 70s movies, and I wasn't shielded from anything. So I, I used to just stay in and bulk watch movies like crazy. So I had a very vast knowledge of movies. And the thing is about my the recent script of the movie I'm trying to do was actually based as a 70s movie, but in present day. So I took inspiration from movies like The Driver, Friends of Eddie Coyle, Mean Streets and things like that, as well as up-to-date movies like Lone Star, uh, the work of John Sayles and things like that, to really kind of sculpt the filmmaker that I wanted to be. And I kind of always sensed that you always th feel 70s cinema was kind of the learning ground for those that want to get into film. Is that right? Well, it, it, it certainly is. You talk about 1970s. Mr. 1970s just called me. Uh, uh, Gene Kirkwood, <laughs> uh, the producer. I've, I've got the, the ringer off. Rocky, Raging Bull. Yeah, the 70s was the learning ground. I, I, think, I think what we respond to in those movies, it's like, you know, like when a, when a kid gets a toy... It's like his favorite toy in the world, you know. I, I think there yeah. was a something 
happening then where there was such an unbridled excitement and enthusiasm about making movies. I mean, look at Sidney Lumet. Uh, like I watched Dog Day Afternoon recently and, mm. and Serpico. Yeah. There's more honesty in those two movies than almost anything being made today. It's like you look at Dog Day Afternoon, you very quickly forget you're watching a movie. You feel like you're eavesdropping in, into a universe. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I read Sidney Lumet's book, too, Making Movies, which is terrific because he was always accused by the critics for not having a visual style. And he found that laughable because he was like, you know, the second you point a camera, you have a visual style because you've made a choice. So that's already ridiculous, okay? But he, too, was doing everything in his power to not remind you that he was there every two seconds. His style was honesty and truth. And, uh, you know, uh, no ego, no bullshit. To me, a lot of the movie, again, I'm not, not to go on and on, but a lot of the movies today, to me, it, 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 they start hiding behind style. And, yeah. and, uh, and I don't need 63 angles to, to watch somebody drink a cup of coffee. I get it. He's drinking coffee. I don't need to see the handle, the thing, the finger go around the that, up to the mouth, to a close-up of the lips. And come on, give me a break. What is this, a Folgers commercial? It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, anyway. It reminds me of that shot in uh, Taken 3 where there's about 12 different cuts of uh, Liam Neeson hopping over a fence. Taken 3. Taken 3. Did oh, I didn't see them? it. Yeah. I didn't see it. Don't I saw the, the first one to me was riveting. And then, uh, you know, then obviously I didn't see the other two. It all depends on what you're trying to do. You know, sometimes you need that type of thing, you know. But if everything, look, what's the old saying? They say if everything is important, then nothing is important. It's the same thing when you're doing a painting. You have the paint, you have the subject, then you have all the things supporting the subject. And then you have the things that are just in the canvas that are not trying to distract off the main idea. But if you try to make every single thing important, then you, you're, you don't know what to focus on when you look at it. When I look at those movies, the reason I get excited by them is because I feel like I'm in the hands of a storyteller. I don't feel like I'm in the hands of a studio executive or I'm not in the hands of some ego maniac trying to show me how great they were. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like let the play do its thing. Even on the last film I did, I'm blessed that I'm getting to do what I want to do. And, and you have to please yourself first. As a writer and as a director, you're the first audience member. And if you're honest with yourself, you know when you're getting it and you're not getting it. So I mean, I, I'm 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 lucky and I'm blessed that I'm still working and that I'm still getting a chance to to to, to make movies. All right. Well, let's go back a little bit to uh, to when you were younger. Now, you decided to switch majors upon being inspired to chase your passion for film, but you were doing graphic design originally. Is that right? Well, I was a painter. Yeah, that that showed up on the internet. I wasn't really a graphic arts major. I wanted to be a, a, a bohemian. I don't know what the hell I wanted to be. I guess I had some vision of being a, a recluse painter. You know, I don't know what. I, but but I was in. Uh, I was at Manhattanville College. I only went to basically two semesters. Then then Mean Streets and a bunch of those movies kind of started to steer me away from painting I wanted to try movie making and I started taking night courses at the State University of Purchase and that's where I saw Friends of Eddie Coyle amazingly enough they they had a really good film program but then I wanted to make it a major they told me I'd have to take I think I'd have to lose a year or start over and then I said you know what I'm not going to learn very much about movies sitting in a class talking about making movies I gotta go trial by fire and I, I quit college and I started trying to write. And then I was like, well, how hard can this be? I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I, I had a, a lot of uh, bravado, if that's the word, as, as a young man. And I, I didn't know what I was doing. But I figured out, I figured, look, I'm, I'm smart. Uh, if other people could do it, I could certainly figure out how to do it. There wasn't a lot of books on how to write screenplays then. There were there were two published screenplays in in paperback form. One was uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which by William Goldman. It was just the script published, and I read it over and over and over again. 
And there was another one, Joe, the, the Norman Wexler screenplay, the Peter Boyle movie, was published. I read movie. that. So then I started figuring, okay, by you know trial by fire again and a lot of just deducing things, I, I realized that around page 22 to 25 of the screenplay, something happened that sort of turned the characters around. I eventually came to know that that was an act break you know, about uh, no later than page 28. And then there was a second act. And then it turned again around page 82 to 88. Something else happened that turned the character towards the finale, which was the third act. And then you worked towards a conclusion. So, I mean, I figured it out, you know, uh, and I started writing. One thing that I wanted to kind of cover is from what I have researched, you ended up moving out to Los Angeles with eight hundred dollars in your pocket which to be honest i can relate to because i had 100 pound left in my pocket when i was invited to pinewood studios for my first ever meeting and i came back with one pound coin in return and i still have that pound coin to this day wow so i understand you kind of made the jaunt to la and then did you start getting your scripts out there no it happened much no it, it actually happened much much earlier I, again, was blessed in that I, I took the most left-handed route in. The, the second script that I wrote was a script called Pros and Cons. It never got made, but it was a comedy about two ne'er-do-well brothers who lived in Co-op City, which is in the Bronx, with their mother, uh, who was a real battle axe. I mean, I wrote about people I knew about, and then I would put them in these crazy kind of situations and they are completely broke refusing to find work like everybody I knew growing up and real street guys and they come up with this idea that they could steal the head off the Statue of Liberty and hold it for ransom <laughs> <laughs> and Brilliant. it was a very funny script uh, and, and they realized that uh, neither one of them knows how to fly a helicopter so they're going to steal a sky crane helicopter off a Navy base. And then they need another guy that's an explosives expert who can blow the head off. And then they need another guy who's an inside guy, you know, that works at, at, the, at, the, at the grounds of the Statue of Liberty at the National Park there, you know. So before you know it, this two-man operation to, turns into like an eight-man crew. I mean, the script is sort of ahead of its time now that I think about it, you know. And these idiots manage to do it. And they hold it for ransom. They, they, they've got it hidden on a garbage scow. They cover it with trash. But the point <laughs> of it is, at the time, the, the Arabs in New York, if you remember, they were buying up a lot of skyscrapers and a lot of property. So one of the guys knows a lawyer that represents these two uh, uh, Arab businessmen, and they sell it to them in the end. Very, It, was, <laughs> it got very well received, but I didn't know what to do with this thing. And I... I gave it to a few of my friends and they were like, wow, this is really funny. And so I thought to myself, well, how do I get this into the world? I literally was totally naive about how to do it. So I got a hold of a New York City phone book because I was living up in Westchester. And I started looking for names, any recognizable name, you know, as if, you know, Al Pacino's phone number was going to be in the phone book. You know, I was like <laughs> looking through all of these names and I came across one name that I recognized because I was a movie geek and I was watching everything on earth, I saw this one name I recognized, Arthur J. Ornitz. And Arthur J. Ornitz shot Serpico. And he shot the Anderson tapes and a lot of these New York movies. And I was like, holy cow, that's Arthur J. Ornitz's home phone number. I'll call him. <laughs> so I called Arthur Ornitz, who ended up becoming a big mentor for me. And I and I you know I've told the story in the past, but I said hi, Mr. Ron. It's my name is George Gallo, and I wrote a screenplay, and I don't know what to do with it. And he was a you know he was an old pro, you know he was probably in his sixties then. And he said, "You sure as f don't know what you're doing if you're calling up an f and cameraman." Uh, <laughs> he goes, but he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I'll I'll read your I'll read your goddamn script. So I sent it to him. And he called me back about a week later and he said, you're a hell of a writer. I went, oh, thank you, Mr. Ornitz. And he goes, stop calling me that. Call me Arthur. I went, okay, Arthur. 
He goes, how old are you? And I, I was 19. He goes, I'm 19. He goes, 19? You're a fucking fetus. I went, <laughs> so. And it's the truth. You know, he said, he goes, I want to meet you. He goes, and he goes, what are you writing about all this middle age angst for? You're 19 years old. Uh, you know, it just, it's from stuff I've heard. So anyway, I met him for lunch and he said, you need a producer. And I went, oh, yeah. He goes, he goes, he goes, you know, Marty Bregman's a good friend of mine. He, you know, I, I shot the, the uh, Serpico for him. And in the meantime, I think he had just done Dog Day Afternoon. He goes, you want to meet Marty? And I went, yeah, that'd be great. So he goes, all right, let's go. <laughs> you know, and he was like three martinis in at lunch, you know. So we, we get into a taxi cab. We go over to Marty Bregman's office. We walk in totally un unannounced. And Marty ended up being a big mentor for me also he he cut you know we we go into his office the guy was eating lunch it's hysterical he was eating i remember he was eating a sandwich he was sitting in his office and arthur says uh hey this kid's a hell of a writer you should know about him and marty said uh martin had this way of talking you know martin says well you must be good because this old bastard doesn't like anything <laughs> so <laughs> You know, so I, I just, it was like a dream. I couldn't believe it was happening. So he goes, all right, uh, you know, give me the script. I'll read it. So I gave it to Marty. He calls me back a week later. He goes, George, it's Martin Bregman. I'm like, I'm like I can't believe any of the, this shit's happening. And he says, I want to, uh, I want to option your screenplay. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? He goes, Jesus Christ, you are like an idiot. He goes, he goes, he goes, you know, it's like, he goes, you need an agent. And I'm like, okay. He goes, go over to the William Morris agency. They're going to represent you on this deal. And I was like, okay. So I went over to the William Morris agency in Manhattan. They're like, on, I think they're like on the 36th floor or something across the street from uh, Rockefeller Center. You know, I'm up there now. And so they, I walk in there and there's this guy, Fred Milstein, and uh, I shake hands with him. And he goes, I'm going to represent you in this deal. And I'm like, what deal? What the F is going on? And they're like, <laughs> Martin Bregman wants to option your screenplay. And I went, okay, great. What does that mean? It means he wants to pay you $10,000 for a year to, to own the rights to the script to set this movie up. I went, $10,000? Now, this is like 1976. $10,000 was like $25 million to me, Okay. You know, my rent was like $230 a month, $10,000. I lived the rest of my life on this money, you know. So <laughs> I never have to work again. Uh, 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 anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so, so they said there, there's one hitch. You got to go out to Los Angeles. They want to meet you at Universal because Universal is going to write the check. So. I don't like to fly very much, but I got on the plane because this was too important. Even even I knew not to f*** this all up. So I flew out to L.A. Now, here's the odd thing. Again, the house that I am sitting in right now, my window is overlooking Universal Studios. I literally am looking at the building where I had that meeting as a kid. Oh, wow. So if somebody had told me if I, you know, in a time machine when I got out of the cab to get into Universal, somebody turned me around and said, you know, in 40 years, you're going to be living in a house right up on that hill. So, I mean, you know, just, it's all so crazy. But anyway, so I went into Universal. I met with them. They blah, blah, blah. We, they talked to me about some changes. And this is, again, this is no bullshit. They drove me to the meeting, but they didn't, they did not drive me back from the meeting. I had no money. I was broke. I was a kid. I, they said, you'll have to take a cab home. And I said, look, I'm embarrassed. I said, does anybody have cab fare? And they all looked at each other and started laughing their asses off. <clears throat> Marty Bregman gave me $20 for the cab and said, <laughs> don't leave the country. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> so anyway, that was how uh, I got into Hollywood screenwriting. So I sold that script. It never got made. But from that, I got a rewrite on something. Oh, the Dino De Laurentiis story is great. All right. Then I saw the screen. I, I got a job working for Dino De Laurentiis when I was 25. In the meantime, I was driving a soda truck on and off. Uh, but I, I was part of a group of guys where we were all pranking each other in, in terrible ways. 
and we would set up these practical jokes because obviously we were all very creative and very bored with tremendous amounts of free time. So my phone rang once around 4.30 in the morning. And I'm like, who is calling me at 4.30 in the morning? I pick it up. And the guy, a, a guy with the most over-the-top and unbelievable Italian accent says to me, is this a Giorgio Gallo? I went, yeah, who the F is this? This is a Dino De Laurentiis. I went, fuck you, and I hung up. All right? Because <laughs> I thought it was my friend Eddie, because he would do stuff like this to me all the time. Then the phone rang a couple minutes later. So this is Giorgio Giagallo. I went, yeah, who is this? This is a Dino De Laurentiis. And I'm like, yeah, all right, I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. Who the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> I'm sorry? I asked. They said yes. <laughs> My wife is giving me shit for cursing. So <laughs> finally, the guy says to me, he didn't call back three times. He says, no, this is really a Dino. I want you to come up to the Gulf and the West in a building. And now he's starting to say things like, I think this might be Dino De Laurentiis that I'm hanging up on. And he, he says, I, the, the, he goes, I want to, he goes, uh, the, the writer's strike is a coming up on a Friday. I need to hire a writer. It was like a Tuesday. I need to hire a writer. On a script, if you come in, I talk to you. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, this is real now. Because these guys didn't know about writer strikes. So I go to meet with Dino, and I said, Mr. Tularanis, I'm really sorry I hung up. I go, oh, no, no, don't, don't worry about that shit. You know? But I said, why did you call me at 4.30 in the morning? Well, he used to get up at these ungodly hours to do business with Italy. So he thought everybody was up at 4.30 in the morning. You know. Anyway, so I got a job doing a rewrite. On a, on, a, on a script that he had. And so then I did that. That was the biggest payday I'd gotten at that point. I think I got about 28000 bucks for that. And you got to remember, I was living in a little apartment in, in upstate, so that's a lot of dough. Mm. And then I would write... You know Julie, Andrew. Of course, uh, of, course. of course. I've known Julie for many But years. she's throwing out all these stories. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I did that earlier. You know what? I, I squandered that money. That that first check I got for like, because I don't want to appear like a total idiot. <laughs> I squandered that original money because, you know, you give a check to a 19-year-old kid for $10,000. I went through that money in about an hour and a half, you know. <laughs> uh, Straight to I Vegas. literally went out. I, I mean, I literally went, I mean, you know, because uh, I went out and I bought like an $11,000 stereo, Okay. And and suddenly, magic! I had I was broke again. Who knew that if you had ten thousand, you spent eleven thousand, you were a thousand bucks in the hole, huh? <laughs> and I would get like you know, I would smoke a joint and get baked between these two speakers, you know, and just come up with ideas for movies. But anyway, I'm sure glad that we shared that. My wife Julie thinks that that's the. It, I don't know if that's interesting to your <laughs> listeners. That, that it, I guess it is. It takes all types to become successful. But, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, getting back to the uh, then I went out to L.A. <laughs> because I felt like at, I was around 26. I felt like I'd kind of used up anything that was going to happen for me in New York, like the between Dino and Marty. I had to get something made. Uh, I got lucky in that. Again, I always felt like there was the hand of God in my career. Uh, I got lucky in that about the time I wanted to leave. Uh, my agent called me and said, there's a guy in L.A. that's interested in a, in a spec screenplay. I'd just written Wise Guys. And they optioned the script. It was Aaron Russo and his brother Irwin. They optioned the screenplay, but they said they wanted me to come out to L.A. to, to write it. So I had 800 bucks in my pocket. I went out to L.A. And uh, I wasn't 100% sure that they were going to option at that point, but I convinced them that I would do these rewrites and stuff. And so I stayed in Los Angeles and then I was here and I was supposed to go back home. And then I met Julie, the love of my life, who uh, was a waitress at the time. She was 19. I was 26 and we met. And that was sort of obviously the beginning of our great love affair that's been going on for 38 years. <laughs> And that is where we have to leave it. 
I know, I know, it was just getting good and you want to know how on earth he manages to stay in Hollywood that doesn't have anything to do with his darling wife. But for that, you're going to have to come back next week for the second half of our fantastic interview with George Gallo. Yes, and it is very much worth it, as you can tell. Uh, I think the interview was originally intended to be like one super uh, episode and we just got too free flowing and we were having too much fun and yeah. George was having too much fun. We were just like, yeah, this is going into a two parter. Uh, so we will bring you the second half next week. And, you know, we get to talk about Midnight Run. Uh, we get to talk about Trapped in Paradise. We get to talk mm-hmm. about, you know, all these other movies. We talk about art. We talk about everything. And as you can tell from just this first part, it's just a, a fabulous guest to have on. Yeah. And what a way to start season three. So as George's nominate five will be tacked on to the end of next week's episode, this week we're going to have a print nominate five. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five? Yes, nominate five. But three or four or six or nine. Now's the time to nominate five. I don't know why I did that then. Uh, I, I, I thought you'd stump your toe coming back into the office. Yeah. And if you thought that we were going to give it up, no, we didn't. We are going to do a nominate five. And I've got one for you, Steve. Oh, God. You ready? Uh-huh. Okay, you got to nominate five of the worst direct sequels you have ever seen. Uh, shh. Okay. Starting at number five, if you will. Okay, so so these are these are just like sequels. Yes. Okay. Right. Not part of a trilogy. You're not including the Last Jedi. So. God. No. No. I was. Oh. Oh. Just, oh. Please let me put in the Last Jedi. I hate that movie. But okay. No. I, the thing is, I. I. Okay. Putting the Last Jedi to one side, then. Can I do movies that were part of a series? Because direct sequels properly narrows it down, and I don't think okay. I'm that right. kind uh, of good. I, I, I will allow that, Bill. All right, go, go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I forgot. I, 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 I'm missing your massive encyclopedic knowledge of everything cinematic. Ew. <laughs> right, are we, uh, we going to start at number five or not? Come on. Okay. People are waiting. Uh, n- uh, number one. Sorry, number five. Shit. <laughs> How can you screw up the goddamn countdown yourself? How? How is that even possible, Steve? I don't know. <laughs> five. Right, five. Okay. Um, I'm going to go <laughs> Police Academy 8, Mission to Moscow. Or is it Police Academy 7, Mission to Moscow? <laughs> yeah. It's Police Academy 7, yeah. Mission to Moscow. Because <laughs> it, 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 it sprung into my mind there. Because I know he's not like a direct sequel to the first one. But they did get progressively worse over the time, but they still had kind of like the same core cast and the same you know, sense of comedy. Then by the time Seven came around, not only was it a few years down the line, is you had people, yeah. other cast members had left. You know, the, the, the amount of effort that was put into that film was just shockingly low. It, I think it was directed video for a very good reason. No, no, it, it did actually have a small theatrical release on a par with oh. Carry On Columbus. Oh, God. <laughs> right. And, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with you here. This is awful. Yeah. It's a great choice, but it is an awful movie. And it's not best remembered by anybody. I I've, don't think so, no. I guarantee you Ron Perlman scrubs that out of his CV. Yeah, I would. Uh, I think his character was called Vitali or something, and he was just yeah. talking about this game, but it was on a Game Boy. And, would, yeah. and, and it's like all movies at that time that were using real world tech. You just look at him and go, that's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. When your saving grace of Mission to Moscow is Leslie Easterbrook's tits, yep. <laughs> you know you've got a bad problem. When you know the only people who could come back were people who were. That pigeonholed for their roles that they could never score another gig without being mm. called Tackleberry. Yeah. Or Jones or Hooks. I mean, City Under Siege was the writing on the wall for me. It was like, yeah, this is over and done with. Yeah. 
but um, Mission to Moscow, I think I've only ever seen once, and I don't think I would ever, ever, ever revisit again. What's the name of the guy that plays Captain Harris? Oh, poor G. W. Bailey. G. W. Bailey. Yeah, he's um, he's he's been in a big series or something recently. I've seen some trailers for it. Like a, he's like a, he's like a detective part of like a little group of detectives. G. W. Bailey seems to have never aged. He's no. always been the exact same age forever. He he really hasn't. I mean, he probably feels it, but he looks <laughs> about the same as he did back uh, back when. Yeah. yeah, back when his horse, when his head was getting stuck up a horse's ass. Yes. <laughs> right. So yeah. So that's number five. All right. That, that's that's a good choice of a movie that should never be seen ever again. All right. Um, the next one. Um, I am going to go with Alien vs Predator. Now I know it technically it's not like a direct sequel, but because it is following on from two franchises and bringing them together. Are we talking about Alien vs. Predator or Alien vs. Predator Requiem? I haven't seen Requiem because I just everyone just went, stay away from it. No one who has actually seen Requiem has seen it because it is that sad in dark. Yeah. But, no, uh, AVP, I, re- I read the comic when I was in my teens and thought, oh yeah. this uh, is yeah, brilliant, this is fantastic, it, 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 this would make a fantastic movie. And then they basically went, okay, we're going to, Take the idea of the the predators using the alien eggs to impregnate people so that they can hunt it, and that's it. All the good stuff that was in the comic was just thrown out of the window and replaced with the most generic people possible and the most generic action sequences possible. And you could tell that it was going to be a bit of a, a bit of a bad sign because. Paul W.S. Anderson was directing oh, it. Oh, poor Paul. I know. You know. I know that he is, he's got dreams. He has. <laughs> yeah, he but, has. And sometimes he can really exercise them, but other times it's... No. Yeah, Alien vs. Predator was a dark period in the history of the Alien and Predator franchises, also known as the PG-13 era mm-hmm. of Alien and Predator franchise, which should never be PG-13 in any way shape or form no um but yes i will agree this is probably the worst cast of any movie you don't care about any of them you can't even remember any of them no you you only know lance henriksen was in because they needed at least some kind of tag to alien he was charles no he was wayland it was he was a wayland yeah he was charles right. charles wayland i think his character was that's it all anyone remembers is um lance henriksen i i i i've got no idea what the name of the main character was i've got no idea of her, of her love interest nothing i always say your movie is instantly in trouble as soon as colin salmon shows up he does like to kill off Colin Salmon, doesn't he? Uh, Colin, he's always Salmon, got him in his um, films and just nukes him. Colin Salmon has a certain range that he fits into. Yeah, and then other films he shows up, and I'm convinced. And this is horrible because Colin Salmon may hear this, and I do apologise, Colin. Um, but in a lot of movies, he delivers the same tone for mm. every single performance the only time i've ever seen him break that was in punisher war zone which is in itself not an amazing it, movie no it really isn't it's an amazingly violent movie and if if you're just watching it for that then great but alien versus predator has so he's like the main black lead and then you have a main black female lead mm-hmm. who is equally as terrible it's not. It was, it's not the fact that it's terrible. It's the fact that the characters. There's nothing to any of them. And when you when your comic relief is spud out of train spotting, yeah, uh, who isn't even funny? It's like, oh, this is my daughter. It's like, yeah, you're gonna die, aren't you? <laughs> as soon as you show any pictures of family, oh. you're gonna die. Yeah, it's easy. Alien versus Predator is shockingly shit. Um, I'd actually forgotten that movie existed, and unfortunately now I know. Um, yes. But yeah, that that was a point where it's like, yeah, it should have been killed off. Because uh, a lot of complaints were it's not violent. You know, there's no violence, there's no blood in it, for God's sake. 
There's no blood in the entire movie, and people are getting killed. Well, Alien was uh, a horror film. It was it was like a it, it was yeah. described as a slasher movie, a haunted house in space. And then but, Alien, then as it went on, you know, it kind of changed tone. But to make it PG thirteen, oh, oh God, no! The unfortunate thing happened is Alien vs Predator Requiem was suddenly too violent, and it's like you know what? We're gonna give you kids dying from the chest burster. We're gonna give you babies being eaten by aliens and all stuff like that. Oh dear, yeah. That's, uh, I don't know what's worse. You've suddenly gone from tame to like way overkill. And it was a very unsettling watch watching Alien versus Predator Requiem. And um, some of it was good. And then other bits, one, it's too dark. It's that dark where you cannot see. Worse than Goblet of Fire dark, Wait, was it? if you can believe that. No, it wasn't Goblet of Fire. It was Half-Blood Prince. Half, sorry, half blue Prince. Sorry, yeah. I, I get my potters mixed up. But yeah, it's, it was... Uh, uh, that's kind of a dark period for those franchises. And I'm not fully convinced Predator has really recovered. I'm going to go and be one of those people that people are going to really hate by me saying that I was not really offended by Prometheus. I, I didn't like Prometheus. No, I I look at it like you're all expecting something different. I went in there kind of already knowing that it didn't kind of link up. No, I was going in there hoping that I'd be watching a movie that made sense and didn't feature a cartographer that got lost. (laughs) When the person that is responsible for making the maps of the area that you're in gets lost. (laughs) Well, in fairness, you know, it's on a new planet, isn't it? Anyway, um, yeah, I'm in agreement on that one with you. All so right. I guess we're down to number three. Now uh, the the three that have the three. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to judge which one goes where really. Um, By the way, I'm going to be extremely disappointed if what the one I'm thinking of did not make your countdown. But go ahead. Possibly are. Um, right. So. Because it's not quite as bad as the others, I'm going to go with Terminator 3. Because you could tell that it just had that Hollywood shine on it that it did not need. It had comedy that it did not need. It upended and completely destroyed everything that had happened in the last two movies. Just to say, well, it still might happen. And then you've got Nick Stahl just doing just a thing... You've got Arnold showing that he's old and can't really be asked because then he wants to go off and become a governor. You know, the whole movie just, it just stinks. And from the moment that he put on those, those red glasses with the, with the little <laughs> Elton John glasses. I'm, I'm pretty damn sure we've discussed this before. <laughs> we probably have done. Yes. It's not really that this is bad. It's just that it's such a massive disappointment coming off the this is this is the this is the equivalent of going on a roller coaster that was terminated and terminated 2 to go on like the 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 kids roundabout that is terminator 3 it's family friendly yet again it's that whole period of oh let's let's make films bloodless no screw that give me blood give me gore give me give me things that's just suitable for the situation it just don't give me don't give me a Terminator that gets around the place by inflating her tits. <laughs> yes, we have spoke about this before. We have, yeah, yes, I think but, fairly um, recently as well. Yeah, and fairly recently. So I, I'm only going to say, okay, yeah, I agree with you there, but Terminator Genesis is way worse. Okay, mm. um, let's quickly move on to number two, so okay. we don't end up recycling material. Number two. Uh, uh, I am I am going to go with Batman and Robin. Okay. Which right. which could have been number one, uh, because up until I saw a certain um star based war film, um uh it this was the worst film that I had ever seen in a cinema by a country mile. To the point that I, I, I just by the end of it I was seriously considering going and asking for my money back. It is just shockingly bad and how you go from Batman to Batman and Robin 
and then consider it to be the same kind of movie series. I I don't understand. Joel Schumacher is actually the, the, on the DVD. He spends most of the time on the commentary apologizing for making the film. <laughs> I'm sorry that this happened. I'm sorry that that happened. It's it, you've got you've got the George Clooney wobbly head that's going on in pretty much every single shot. <laughs> you, oh God, Arnold Schwarzenegger! He can't get hot. Why is he smoking a cigar then? <laughs> You know he has to he has to say school and he's got a stogie hidden out of his mouth. Yeah, we get it. You're Arnold Schwarzenegger. You like cigars, but come on, let's keep in contact with the character. It's just I, no, it's so much wrong with that movie. I don't even know where to begin. I will admit, the movie is shocking, but I will actually say it has gone right back around to awesome for how bad it is. Mm. Because I will happily watch that movie with my son who thinks it's awesome, and I can sit there and say, you don't know shit. <laughs> right? It's only because you're too young to watch Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises and stuff like that, but you'd, you'd watch them anyway. But um, Batman and Robin is a ridiculous orgasm of colour. And, and yeah. neon. And, and Coolio. And Coolio, the stage diver of the universe. <laughs> um <laughs> Champion stage diver. He doesn't even need a crowd no. to catch him. <laughs> um, and Nicky's trainers. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's very weird. I remember the first time that I watched Batman and Robin, and it was Christmas. And uh, I was there like, this is bad. I know it's bad. But my God, I'm not turning it off. Kind of look at it and think, you know what? It's bad, but acceptable bad. Oh, it really is. And there's so much about this movie, which is so cringe-inducing. Everything. Every, every single time I've seen it, I've caught like bits of it on TV. As a, a, you know, I've been flicking through channels, and I kind of linger for a few minutes just to see, okay, really, is this as bad as I remember? And then, you know, there'll be some piece of dialogue. Like Uma Thurman, in particular, is just... <laughs> She's. I don't even know if she's kind of staring into the skid with with a performance of Poison <laughs> Ivy, but she's so over the top in just everything. Every single character is over the top. Uh, e- even you get someone like was it Bruce Glover? Yeah, playing uh, the mass, the weird doctor <laughs> guy. <laughs> Every single person in this movie is going over the top, including Michael Gow, who's going over the top. Dying. <laughs> How do we know Alfred is dying? Because he leans over and goes, Whew. Yes. <laughs> Pat Hingle loses every bit of acting credibility he's had in his life by being so over the top. I don't you think know? he gave a shit at that point. You know, oh, we, we're talking about just... guys that are still living off the residuals of the original Batman, let alone the yeah. rest of it. They don't care. It's just... Happy to be working, you know. Yeah. Uh, the only person who's like really trying and thinking, oh God, what am I doing? Is poor Chris O'Donnell. I yeah. think his career never recovered from it. I don't uh, think Alicia Silverstone's did either. Both of them yeah, kind should... of petered out around about the same time, didn't they? Yeah. And the th- George was just like, oof, hopefully I've got something better coming out next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was looking back at Return of the Killer Tomatoes and going, Actually, it wasn't that bad. Uh... <laughs> and in truth, he wasn't. He's was probably the best thing in that as well. That was but, actually um, quite funny. I like that film. It was. It was. There's some really good jokes in Return of the Killer Tomatoes. So the product placement joke is one of the best I've ever seen. I'm going to have to rewatch it tonight, I think. You yeah, are. Yeah. You are. So here's one you will not be rewatching. Your number one. And what is it? Oh, my number one is. Uh, and this is, the reason why Batman and Robin didn't get number one is because it was like a steady decline. Okay, you had like a little kind of upturn with Batman Returns, but then the rest of it was just down, down, down. This is just from one movie that was actually really, really good fun and really enjoyable. <laughs> vertical nosedive. I know exactly what you're This say. is Mortal Kombat Annihilation. <laughs> yes! I knew. I just knew this was going to be number one. Oh my god! I, I don't even know 
I don't even know where to begin. Do we begin with the casting? Do we begin with the rotten acting? Do we begin with the incredibly shoddy special effects? Do we begin with the massively inflated budget that was about twice the same as the original, but looked like it was filmed in a quarry somewhere for like five fifty? It's there is no part of this movie that works. The the characters are just shoved in there for no pur- purpose whatsoever other than the fact that they can go, hey, look, it's Cyrax, or here's Nightwolf. None of that. They just they just throw them in there. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God, you've got James Ramar taking over from um, uh, uh, Christopher Lambert Christopher as Lambert. Raiden, and then he just randomly shows up with, with his hair cut short. And I've got nothing against James Ramar, but he's... he's it's like the whole character is completely changed. It might as well just be a completely different character, and there's plenty of characters in Mortal Kombat that you can pull from. But it's just, oh god, it is just a cacophony of noise, kind of like this sentence. But it's just a cacophony of noise that just—it's like dangling a set of keys in front of a baby. Well, well, something else is well. A murder's going on in the background to try and distract you from it. It's like, oh, look at the shiny, shiny thing! Don't pay any attention to the rest of the movie that makes no sense whatsoever. It's, uh, it, yeah. it's the very bizarre. I remember, like, I was looking up facts about Mortal Kombat Annihilation, and the only fact that really raised an eyebrow from me. So, if you add up the amount of flips in this movie. <laughs> oh God! What? There is, there is fifty four flips in this movie, which is over half of the runtime. And I bet most of them are shot from below. Quite possibly, if you can see them. Yeah, that would be the other thing. But you had half of the cast deciding not to come back. <laughs> you had other After... cast members that were just that just their contracts weren't renewed because they wanted too much money. Yes. And unfortunately for some people, this is like the first movie on their CV. Like poor Ray Park, who I guess now would love to have any movie on his CV. (laughs) Oh my God. But it was the cinematographer, wasn't it? The director was the cinematographer of the first movie. Yes. Uh, I can't remember his name, but yeah, pretty much. It was uh, Leonetti, John Leonetti, I think his name was. I think so, yeah. But he kind of... They kind of just like threw him in there because thinking, oh, he knows what he, he knows what he wants. But then he was just like, I, I, uh, wait, um, uh, okay, let's just let's just do this, and let's just do that. And I think they had a they went on a massive globe trotting shoot with this as well. But none of that shows up on the film. All of it looks <laughs> no. like it was shot in the same quarry in the middle of Wales somewhere. With the exception of the uh, the exteriors of the temple, which are obviously shot in uh, Cambodia or Thailand or somewhere like that. Um, well, the desert stuff was all filmed in uh, the Anglesey. So it was actually in Wales. Oh, God. If you can believe that shit. When you're bringing your movie to film in Wales in a quarry yard, mm. uh, that's the first problem. Uh, I know it was filmed in Jordan as well. I think Jordan. Not as in the, the model who's currently going to prison. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I knew and just knew Mortal Kombat two uh, was was gonna be uh, your choice. The, and, the um, first one's a really enjoyable kind of Enter the Dragon kind of take on it. Uh, you know, they've got a really nice roster of characters that they pulled from the first game. Everyone's got their own little moment on screen to shine. Everyone kind of has some kind of story or journey that they're going on even if it's only to a smaller degree and even that it's not a brilliant film I'm going to admit that it's not a brilliant film but it is an enjoyable film but this one is just this this should be used in filmmaking classes as an example of what not to do when making a sequel yes and the the incredibly cheapness on some certain moments of this movie uh, one that I remember so vividly, and it's a fight when you're seeing uh, Luke. Is it Luke Kang and Baraka? Mm-hmm. And they're fighting around that fire pit. Yeah. So when Luke Kang hits Baraka into the fire pit, they reuse the footage of rain being thrown in there by Shao Kahn earlier instead of Baraka falling in. 
Oh, yeah, they do, don't they? And not only that, you also see a hand reach up to grab him as he's falling <laughs> from the fire pit. In the, it's just stuff like that that really just is too revealing. <sighs> I did hear one thing in regards to the, the, the special effects and everything, that they put the film together and they did a rough cut, which is, you know, it's normal in Hollywood. And then they did some test screenings before they'd finished the special effects. And oh, there's still wires in there. I know, and, and the and, around. and the audience they were rating everything that that they saw, and they looked at all the audience rating for the special effects and just went, "Oh, the audience seemed to really like it. Ah, fuck it, leave it as is." Oh yeah, so you've got rocks that move mm-hmm. when they're thrown into it. For one, you've got that great moment where. Um, the, the Sonya Blade stunt double's wig falls off during a fight. Yep. <laughs> oh, there's so many. You've got that so wonderful many. moment as well. Mother, you're alive. It's too bad that you will die. <laughs> God. God. That's actually... It, it is bad. You know what? I, I think we've just found our next watch along. <laughs> I think we probably have. Yes, that, this one will be fun. Ah. Uh, yeah. That, that's probably the most famous line from it. Yeah. Uh, well, it was no surprise what was going to be number one, really. And it is absolutely god-awful. Truly. Um, Truly. I rented that. I remember renting it from the video store. I saw it in the cinema. Uh, oh, you went... Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. You spent real money on that. Yeah. You know, I, I spent £2.50 on a rental. But I remember sitting watching it going... This is awful. If this tape snapped, it'd be an improvement. Static saved me now. I know, I know. Well, I can definitely tell you that's not going to be in the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Well, explain what what's in the box is to the people who have unfortunately been built up brilliantly by a fantastic video promo and this has been their first episode okay well if you've managed to stick it out this far what's in the box is the part of the show where randy tries to improve my movie education and stop me watching things like mortal Kombat annihilation (laughs) (laughs) Uh, he's going to put his hand into a box full of films which is certified fresh on rotten tomatoes and then pull one out if I have seen it, then he keeps pulling out names until we find out one that I haven't seen, and then I go away and watch that the day before we record our next show. So, what do we have? Well, what we have... Actually, I don't think we've had this genre before, and I know you kind of like mockumentaries. Mm-hmm. So, I've got a, a mockumentary called Kenny, and it's an Australian mockumentary about the uh, misadventures of a Porter John worker through his personal and professional life. So, I have heard of that one. I haven't seen it, but yeah, I, I remember as soon as you said uh, the Porter Johns, yeah, I remember seeing that in the trailers. Yes, uh, uh, it's actually pretty funny, really. I think you'll enjoy that. And uh, we haven't spoke about mockumentaries, but I know that you di- do like them from discussing them on the Barbara Koppel episode. Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, stuff like... Um, I quite fond of stuff like Mike Bassett and uh, like all the Christopher Guest stuff. Best in yes. Show and, and Mighty Wind. I like that Spinal one. Tap. Spinal Tap, yep. But you have not seen Spinal Tap, have you? I have seen Spinal Tap. Oh, okay. Well, take that one out of the box then. Yeah. Right, well, I guess that's everything now for this week. Um, big thank you once again, George Gallo. And don't forget you can hear the second part of his interview next week right here on the same Bat Channel. Yes. And also uh, to Julie as well who has her own little cameos during these interviews. <laughs> hi, Julie. She's in the background. Uh, hi, Julie. We're, we're getting you on ourselves, Julie. And then George can just, like, shout stuff from the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. We're, we love it. This is the future. We're going to have couples on our show. This would be absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, Packin I mean, and Jeff Daniels, for example. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, God. You're really going to make me... Go- You're going to hold that one over me now for months. <laughs> yeah. Um... So yeah, uh, we just want to say it is such a pleasure to be back. Uh, we, we kind of took uh, a month off and we know some people have missed us and have been wondering when we're coming back. And here we are, we're, we're back. We've got an interesting season ahead. 
Mm -hmm. um, plenty of guests and who knows I, I might we might even be doing an episode countries apart at some point you never know fingers crossed but for now fingers though crossed. it is a goodbye from me and i guess i'll see you next week as well because i've got nothing else to do around here tatty bye <laughs>